Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, my name is Kimya, and I am an alcoholic. Hey, Kimya. And my sobriety date is October 18th. Good Lord, am I going to get this right? 2013. Uh, I have a home group. You guys haven't seen me in a while, but I do have a home group. Um, primary Purpose meets on Mondays at Ridgeview and also here on Fridays at this same time. Uh, I have a sponsor who has a sponsor who are both here tonight. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, and uh, so tonight I'm going to talk about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Um, interestingly enough, I got a hold of the audio recording the last time I told my story here, so I was listening to that on the way here, and I'm going to be a lot more conscious about how I break up those three parts and how much time I spend, Um, because 37 minutes in, I still had not gotten to the solution, so I'm going to spare you guys the drunk along. I'm going to try to, Um, but uh, so, you know, starting out a little bit about me, I was born and raised here in Georgia, um, grew up on a, in a little place called Fayetteville, which is a suburb south of the city. Um, have a sister, we're 15 months apart, she's younger, and um, was born to a mother uh, who is not one of us and a father who is. Um, I was not aware of the fact that my father was an addict or an alcoholic until much later in life. Um, but obviously that is a part of my story and actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise in terms of Um, just the acceptance and someone who's walked this path before. Um, I showed very clear signs of being restless, irritable, and discontent when I was younger. A lot of character defects that were just oozing out of me. Everything from impatience to selfishness, self-centeredness, vengeance, a very vengeful person. So I didn't let things go. I held on to resentments and I acted on those resentments. So it wasn't just about the internal pain, but I wanted to make sure I got back at the person. A good example of that is um, if my mom or my sister did anything that I didn't like growing up, what I would do is I would go in their closet and one of two things would happen. I would either cut small holes in their clothing or I would just like, you know, throw little smatterings of bleach um, onto the clothing. And when they would confront me about it later on, I would I was, you know, shocked that anyone would ever, you know, accuse me of such heinous acts. Um, But that's just just an example of like I, you know. Everything was about me, and um, you know that that kind of continued throughout my childhood. Um, we were blessed and we were loved as children. So I don't have one of those stories where you know there was a lot of childhood trauma, or um, you know, or we didn't get the attention and the love and the support that we needed. We got all of those things. I just still was um, just kind of like hell on wheels. And um, as I kind of progressed, um, I guess you could say I was a late uh, drinker. So I did not have my first drink until I was, I think we were on our senior trip in Cancun. And I grew up, uh, I don't know what the ages of everybody in the room are. I grew up in the MTV era. So I grew up seeing like MTV, the grind and spring break. And to me, like that was the life. I was like, see, that's what it's all about. Like getting super wasted on the beach and just kind of living that life in a bikini, having loads of fun, no responsibilities. You know, that's what I want to do with my life. So, you know, had my first drink in Cancun. There was no drinking age and I was hooked from the first drink. Dancing on tables, you know, inhibitions fell away. I was like, man, like this is exactly like Carmen Electra said it would be. Like, this is <laughs> awesome. And I can't wait to go to college. Um, I got into a school that I did not particularly believe I deserved um, to get into I, academically. You know, I was an okay student. I was really involved in a lot of social activities, but, you know, I was by no means like the cream of the crop. And this school was very much for, um, overachievers and kids who had a lot of money who could afford the tuition. And so I started to experience a lot of anxiety around um, going to this college where, oh God, am I going to fit in? And, you know, I just don't measure up. And, um, and I think that was the first time I was kind of starting to feel that 
fear of not belonging. You know, in high school, I was kind of able to, you know, um, you know, slide through and everything. But, you know, I started getting a lot of anxiety about that. Um, but that was helped by the fact that there was loads of alcohol and lots of drugs on campus. So once I got there, um, my strategy was essentially, all right, I want to live this MTV, the grind, like spring break lifestyle. But in order to kind of balance things out, because that's that's what I've done with my life, I need to be- have some balance. Um, I will study, you know, like crazy because I got to be able to measure up to the other kids. So after class, you know, I would go to the library and I would study and I would do all my work. And that left the entire night to be able to party and do all of the experimentation that I wanted to do without any of like the ramifications of like being irresponsible. So, you know, you balance, you know, out being on the dean's list with being in um, a group that was called Triangle L, which I don't know who launched the group, but it was a triangle. Now I'm I'm connecting the dots. It makes no sense. But essentially, um, they basically forced you into um, the woods. Um, they shoved a handle of alcohol down your throat. There were bongs and joints and other things and uh, grog. And you were essentially like pushed down to your knees and forced to ingest all of this alcohol. But afterwards, you got a hat with a triangle on it and an L. And mine, my maiden name um, at the time, my maiden name was Coker. And my hat was inscribed with Toker Coker. So now I had a real identity. You know what I mean? Like, be- Becoming a part of Triangle L was like this huge achievement for me. Um, I'm supposed to be in school getting an education, but instead I'm out in the middle of, and I think it was a graveyard because there were some some headstones and stuff like that. But anyways, uh, regardless, (laughs) so that happened. So I'm starting to like really identify now with like this idea that, all right, there's this group of kids that like does drugs and parties and gets wasted and blacks out. And that's cool. You know, so I can, you know, I feel like I kind of, you know, felt my my way into the social landscape that way but of course you want to balance it out so I got um, I was nominated by the Dean to participate on something called the conduct board where they brought students in front of this body of six uh, of their peers and we made decisions on whether or not these kids were going to be able to stay in school after being caught with things like guns um, or drugs or drinking on campus So it just became a theme in my life that as long as I've got my shit together over here, then I deserve, I've earned the right to be able to kind of, you know, imbibe these things. Um, Got introduced to a lot of other substances. I'll try and stick to singleness of purpose as long as I can until it's relevant for me to kind of talk about some other things. But, um, you know, got out of college. Um, had a plan, wanted to be an attorney. That was what I wanted to do since I was five years old. I had it all planned out and I got out of undergrad and I was like, okay, got to, you know, take the LSAT and all this stuff. And so about two weeks before the LSAT, I realized I should get a book or I should go to a class or something because everybody else has been talking about this for six months. Needless to say, I didn't do well on that. And so I decided, you know what, I'm just going to take a year off and, you know, get into some internships and things like that. And I stumbled into a career in technology, which at the time, um, the dot-com bubble. So there's all these startups and everything is very work hard, play hard, you know? So the atmosphere of these companies I was working for, they had beer carts, you know, coming around like at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, Part of my job was to host these happy hours where they said, okay, Kimia, here's the corporate card, go and buy, you know, six bottles of this, get 10 bottles of that, you know, whatever. So I'd be like, okay, well, y'all don't really need all this and nobody's counting. So I'll just keep a couple, you know, for myself, for my personal, you know, because I did have to go and do this, you know, so, and it's outside, you know, work hours. So just trying to kind of make up, you know, for, for the extra work. Um, so, uh, around this time, um, I am kind of made aware of the fact that my dad, all those retreats and those work trips he was going on when we were younger were actually stints in rehab. And so, you know, I'm kind of made aware of the fact that, Hey, your dad is an addict and alcoholic. And he kind of talks to us about it. 
And what he says is, this is a family disease. This has been known to get passed down. Your grandfather is an addict and alcoholic. Two of his brothers died from this disease, you know, and he's starting to see little patterns and starting to see, you know, my behavior. Um, and so he begins kind of just throwing out these little warnings, little nudges of, you know, be very careful because you could have this disease and, um, it's all fun and games now, but what will happen is one day it won't be. And one day you're going to wake up and you're gonna want nothing else in the world than to stop. And you're not gonna be able to. And that, I couldn't fathom that because it's, well, if you wanna stop something, you'll just stop. Why, you know, that it just, I could not comprehend why you couldn't just use your willpower, you know, just, you know, buck up and, you know, drink like a gentleman, you know, like the book says. So anyway, I, you know, continue to go on with life and I'm having a great time and I'm traveling and things are still fairly fun. Um, but then, you know, get into, I guess, probably maybe mid to late twenties. And some of our friends start to kind of, uh, the way that I saw it was they were starting to grow up. So they were getting married. They were talking about starting families, you know, all of a sudden we were going and hanging out and, you know, bringing drugs, you know, to these gatherings was not as welcomed, you know, as it once was. And so I'm starting to feel like, okay, you know, it's time, maybe it's, it might be time for me to get my stuff together. Like I've got to grow up at some point. It wasn't, I might have a problem and they don't. It was, oh, they're getting mature and they're starting to do all this domestic stuff. And it was more of like this image, you know, that I wanted of being, you know, someone who went and jogged in the morning and someone who, you know, could just get off work and maybe like just go home and chill or like go take, you know, a gym class instead of having to go directly to the dope man's house. Um, or get, you know, super drunk every weekend. And um, it, I think it was around this time as well that I was introduced to the thing that along with alcohol would all but cut me to ribbons, as the book says. And that was, um, and I'm not gonna make reference to it again, but that was, you guys know this epidemic that's going on. There's this legal stuff that you can get, you know, through doctor shopping or other means. And, uh, and that was definitely my thing. That plus alcohol. Alcohol was an all, always a constant. Um, and so, you know, things are kind of going along. I've still got this great lifestyle. I've got a good job. My life is manageable, you know, because all my bills are paid. I've got, you know, my own condo. Um, you know, I can kind of come and go as I please. Things are good. Um, but I start to like long for, I guess what I was looking at it is, is like this simpler life where I would see people jogging down the street or I would see my neighbors just out with their dog or people with kids. And I'd be like, man, like, you know, I would look at people and be like, how are they living life without being at least a little bit high, you know, all the time? Like, how are they doing this? You know, like, you know, and just starting to consider the fact that like, I just want to be like one of them. I just want to be normal. Like that's, that's what I want. I just want to be able to live life and be like healthy and responsible. Um, but then there was that thing kind of pulling me back and saying, you know what, girl, you still got a, a paycheck coming, you know, next week. So just, keep, you know, just keep riding it out. You'll, you'll figure it out. And, um, and so, you know, I went on and on and things started to get progressively worse. So some of the things that my dad was talking about many years before started to happen. Um, essentially, I started, my behavior um, became extremely, let's see, how do I want to put this? I mean, not even unpredictable, but I was doing things that I would describe as insane. Um, I had two grandparents who died within about nine months of each other. And instead of kind of, you know, seeing how I could be of service to my parents who were losing their parents, to my family, you know, who's kind of going through, you know, this really tough situation, I used that as an opportunity to procure more of the thing that I needed to get. Cause I was like, well, they don't need all these drugs, you know, I mean, I, so I use that, that is insane thinking standing next to someone's deathbed and taking you know the pills the medication that they've been prescribed to make themselves comfortable as they leave this place um i took full advantage of that and somehow in my mind i was able to kind of justify it by saying 
they don't know what's going on. You know, but, but like they don't need it. They've got plenty. Um, I had started to even tell my dope dealer, like, hey, this is the last time, you know, I'm coming here. OK, so <laughs> like if I call you, you know, just no, like just don't pick up the phone. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm going, you know, I'm going on a new path. You know, I got this new journey two days, two days later, I maybe made it 48 hours. So things are just starting to look grim and I'm starting to maybe concede to my innermost self that maybe I have a little bit of a problem here, but I'm not quite ready to let it go just yet. Cause I know I still got time. That's that imaginary line. You know, I had probably crossed it by then, by the time I realized it, but I didn't know it. And so I was like, once I'm ready, I'll just use all my willpower, you know, like my dad couldn't, and I will just lick this thing and I'll be done and I'll go on about the rest of my life and I'll be this mature adult like all my other friends. And um, there was an incident specifically, and I know my sponsor would want me to tell this story because I, it's it's easy to forget when you've got to go back and do your fourth and fifth step. Things that happen that you just, you completely forget about, but it just paints a picture of like how desperate I was to kind of keep, you know, t to feed the habit. Um, one, I, I'm going to go backwards a little bit. In college, I had a best friend, still a great friend of mine today. And um, that desperation, that insanity of like, what would you do willing to go to any length for the drug or for the next high? Um, we decided that at the end of the year, when you are going to sell your books back and you get, you know, get some good money for them, that the biology books are worth the most. And I did not take biology and neither did he. And we were thinking to ourselves, man, we could make a grip if we could get our hands on some biology books. So under the influence of drugs and alcohol, we headed over to the library. We had hatched this plot and, uh, we went to the library where our peers were all studying for their finals, most of them pre-med students. And um, we looked around for the empty desks that had no person, but with the largest books on them that we knew could get the most return um, for the book return. And we stole away with multiple books uh, from other students. We then went back to his room. We celebrated, um, you know, how crafty we had been and then a knock comes on the door and it's uh my best friend's ra and he says hey did you guys happen to see a biology book laying around in the library what why would you even ask us that? no library we weren't even there well because somebody saw you leave with it um that money was supposed to be for our end of year drugs you know so just get Literally, that's that's at the beginning, you know what I mean? But just this kind of behavior, like this is addict behavior. This is a, like addict thinking, alcoholic thinking. It was fully ingrained in me. And fast forward, when that thinking kind of took on um, another life, I had a neighbor, um, and I tell this story just to let you know, like towards getting towards the end of my drinking career, how desperate I was. So I had started, you know, figuring out like, okay, I got a problem. All right, I'm gonna, I'll fix it tomorrow. Let me just get through this next bottle and then tomorrow I'll address it. I know I can do this. I'll just, you know, do some detox. I do like yoga. You know, this is just all a matter of, you know, kind of cleansing the body and the spirit and I'm just not ready to do it yet. But when I'm ready, I'll just lick this thing and I'll move on with my life. And um, I had a neighbor and she was prescribed certain medications and we would get together and party, you know, after work and we'd hang out at each other's houses and we had digital door codes to get into, you know, our condos. And so we knew each other's codes. And um, once I kind of decided like, okay, this is, I I've got to figure out how to stop. Like I... I don't, I don't want to live like this anymore. So, but I'm not going to those meetings that my dad has taken me to. Like those people are a bunch of yahoos. Like that's definitely not the path I'm going down. So I got to figure this out on my own. Plus I don't want to tell anybody cause that doesn't match with my lifestyle and my image is really important. And you know, I got low self-esteem. So like I, you know, it's, it's very important for me to keep up a certain, you know, put that mask on like the book talks about. So um, what started happening is I would get rid of everything, you know, that night and I'd be like, tomorrow's the day I'm getting clean tomorrow. And I would wake up and there is no clearer, like 
nothing resonated more with me than when I read, I think it's Bill's story. And he talks about the morning madness being upon him and like what that, that felt like. And I would wake up desperate. Like, I know I said it was going to be today, but I just got to take the edge off. I, I can't go to work like this. I got to get something. And so I started using her code to access her house, going in, taking medication. Let's, let's be clear. I was breaking into her house. Okay. And I was taking her medication that she was prescribed that she needed. And I justified it by, well, you know, we're neighbors and we do drugs together anyway. So, you know, it's probably not a big deal. Well, anyway, fast forward, I'd been doing this a couple months and she comes over one day and she knocks on my door and she's like, Hey, you know, I really need to talk to you. And I said, come on in, sit down. Like, can I get you a drink, a joint, anything? Um, and she said, someone has been breaking into my house and stealing my medication. And my heart stopped because I hadn't been caught, you know, like I'm still wearing this mask and I, you know, and my heart stopped. Now, of course, the, my alcoholic mind is like, think of a lot, think of a lot, think of a lot, like come up with something. You got a good story. You're creative. And, uh, and she said, yeah, she said, I parked my car behind my house this time. And I start to hear someone entering the code on my door. And when I walked, you know, up to the door, it was our neighbor from downstairs. And he realized he had been caught, but he's been stealing this medication from me all this time. And I, this is Academy Award winning. I said, I am disgusted. I cannot <laughs> believe it. How, the, how violated he, I cannot believe Amanda, we need to call the police right now. Isn't he on probation? We need to get in touch with his probation officer. This is not okay. I will go with you to the police station. We need to report this. This is just, oh, it's disgusting. And this man needs help. He is sick. And I mean, I put on, the, I mean, the show of a lifetime. But it was like, again, I didn't need to go that far, but that alcoholic in me was like, no, no, no. Not only do I need to like make sure this guy gets what's coming to him, but I need to make sure to take all the heat off of me because right now that could have been me. And so it's not so much that, oh, he's sick. He needs help. It's that, okay, phew, I didn't get caught. That guy, you know, we would have been, should have been sitting next to each other in rehab. So just an example, but I want to fast forward to, this is starting to get towards the end um, of my drinking career where I am sure, 100%, I have this thing. And um, my dad's words just reverberating in my head. You're going to want to stop. You're not going to be able to. And he said, and I will never forget, he said, it is a living hell. Waking up every morning with that, that desperation of wanting to stop. And I just, there was no amount of willpower. The last thing that I tried, um, I used to sit up and watch TV at night and there were commercials and this guy would come on the screen and he would say, I used to be addicted to crack, but now I'm not. And they would talk about this book and it was called the alcoholism and the addiction cure. And I was like, okay, that'll be the first thing. Let me self-knowledge like that will fix it. So I went to Barnes and Noble, you know, one day after work, I'm like, I'm going to do this now the good alcoholic I am, I'm not paying for that book. I'm just going to read it here. So I sat every day, you know, after work for like two, two and a half hours. And I read this book cover to cover. And I was like, man, like, what are those people doing in AA? Like, don't they know there's a cure? You know, it talked about, hey, you can put together your own recovery program. You know, you can do your own detox, you get some acupuncture, yoga, you know, all of these different things. Maybe talk to a therapist, but you can do this, you know, on your own. It's all about healing the underlying causes of addiction. Once you figure out why you drink, you're good to go. So I'm like, oh my God, this is so easy. Like, I love it. I'm going to put together my own program because I like yoga. You know, I like eating organic and raw foods. Um, and I also started doing the master cleanse, which if anybody knows what it is, it is essentially a starvation diet. But for 14 days, you um, consume nothing but uh, it's a mixture of water, lemon, cayenne pepper, and maple syrup. And you eat nothing and you drink this, but it like fully detoxes you clearly because there's nothing in there left. And so I decide, you know, those weak minded people who have to go to detox and actually like take pills and be, you know, um, you know, someone's got to kind of guide them through. I'm strong. So I'm going to do a detox the natural way. And I did this three or four times, 14 days, no food. But guess what? I still smoke cigarettes and weed while I did it because, you know, that's natural, right? Um, tobacco grows, I guess, on leaves. I didn't think about that. But anyway, so I do this and I've got my whole plan and, you know, I'm like, this is great. Like, I feel amazing. Why? Because I'm starving, you know? So I think my, my, my brain is probably gone into like, 
you know, um, uh, recovery mode or whatever. But um, and that worked for a couple weeks, and then I'd have to start it over, and I'd have to start it over, and finally, um, I was like, okay, maybe I have a worse problem than I thought. So I start praying. Now I grew up in the church, so I'm like, I'm gonna pray to this God that you know is out there, the God of the Bible. And I'm just going to ask him, you know, you work miracles every day. Take this away. You can cure me. I want to be healed. Just cure me. Just take this all away. I know I'm an alcoholic. I'm telling you that should be good enough. Okay. Just take this all away. And I'm praying like that. And I'm, you know, juice fasting and just doing different stuff. And I get asked one day by my boss to, he said, hey, this partner's in town. You know, he thinks really highly of you. Can you take him out? Um, You know, have a few drinks, kind of pitch him on, you know, our, our value prop. Sure thing. No problem. Um, I hit my neighbors first because before I go do this, I need to, yeah, I was like, ooh, I feel a little jittery, girl. You got anything, you know, kind of smooth me out? She gives me something. Uh, I proceed to have, I think the equivalent of probably over two bottles of wine alone and then whatever beers I had with him. And we're, you know, at this hotel and I then enter into a blackout. When I come to, I'm in his hotel room. Now, nothing that I know of, because I'm in a blackout, nothing happened, but I know not of what I did or said in that time. Same as the big book. Like, I just, I can't tell you what happened. Um, I came to again, and I was getting in my car, and I was headed home. I lived about two miles from there, and I see blue lights in my, you know, rearview mirror, and I'm like, oh, God, like, this is so inconvenient, you know, because I got to get home. I got an executive breakfast in the morning. Like, you know, let me just get this over with so I can get home. And, you know... I would like to tell you the way I remembered it was that I stepped out of the car. Um, but the way the camera showed up was that I, I fell out. <laughs> so, um, you know, the cop said, you know, you're going to jail and me, you know, and I'm uh, flabbergasted. I told you I only had two glasses of wine. You know, my sister's an attorney. I don't, you know, I've been... anyway, I go to jail <laughs> and I get there and I am full on, I mean, balls to the wall, like I am wasted and I've got some other stuff in my system. And so I get my phone call and I've watched a lot of true crime TV and a lot of prison dramas. So I know what you need to do when you go in and that's, you need to make a name for yourself. You know what I mean? Now, either you've got to hit somebody, you got to be somebody's, you know, you don't want to end up being somebody's bitch is what I had seen on TV. And so I called, you know, I get the phone, the phone's right there in front of everybody. So I call my sister and I'm like, Hey, I need you to come get me. She's like, where are you? And I was like, jail. And she was like, what happened? And I said, I stabbed somebody, you know, and I'm looking around, you know, making sure everybody heard me because I really need to, you know, make sure they know, like, I am not to be messed with. It is, this is the drunk tank. Like, nobody who's, anyway, um, next morning, pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. I was like, what the fuck just happened? Like, you know, now it's all coming to me. My dad comes and gets me the next day and he is just as smooth and calm as, you know, this is a dad who was, he was the disciplinary when I grew up. And he said to me, so you got your first DUI. And I'm like, what is wrong with him? You know, he was seven in by the time he got, you know, into the program. So, but later on, I realized like he's read this book. He knows how you approach another alcoholic. You don't come to them and say, you need to do this and you will do that. So he was just, you know, just calm as a cucumber. And I'll never forget it. We were driving down Treasure Bridge Road. We had been to three different places trying to get my car to impound. I'm exhausted. I'm hungover. I'm just embarrassed. And he, you know, turns to me and he says, you think you might want to get some help casually? Like, I mean, just like in passing. And the scales fell from my eyes. I mean, I surrendered in that moment. I was done. And I was like, I need help. However, I need to get it. I need help. I cannot do this on my own. I have tried everything that I could think of. And self-knowledge has not helped. Uh, Personal detox plan has not helped. Um, They say, you know, that the alcoholism and addiction cure, by the way, was written by two guys who own a place in Malibu. And apparently um, I wasn't going to be going there. Um, They let me know that I would be checking into Peachford. Um, They did not have yoga. They did not have an organic chef. And there were no um, beautiful vistas or landscapes or ocean. Um, It was just me and a bunch of other addicts and crazy people like myself. 
and uh, went through detox there. And I still wasn't convinced this was going to be a lifelong thing. You know, like I was, okay, I went to detox and get this out of my system. They said, go to these 90 meetings, 90 days. I can follow instructions. All right, I can do that. I'll go to these meetings, you know, for a while until I'm kind of back on my feet. And then I'll just move on with my life, you know. But I did not see myself, like, sticking to this program. Like, I couldn't imagine. I was like, why do these people keep going to these meetings? If they say 12 steps works, then why do they have to keep going back? Like, if it's, you know, you work the 12 steps, you know, move on. Um so, you know, I went to the meetings and, uh, you know, I basically, in my mind, you know, I said all the things they wanted to hear. And I also knew that um, there were things I was definitely not going to do, like going to the meetings. Okay, I could do that. Getting a sponsor. Hell no. What can another person who made some of the same mistakes as, you know, as I did, what can they tell me about, you know, trying to, you know, fix my life and things like that? So I'm not going to do that. Um, you also need to, you know, sponsor people, carry the message. Definitely not going to do that. Anybody who would ask me to be their sponsor is doomed anyway. So, um, you know, there were just that work the steps. I'm never going to tell anybody all of my deepest start. What does that have to do with stopping drinking? And my higher power, the way that my higher power showed up was like, I was six months in, you know, I finally got a sponsor because people were harassing me. You know, do you have a sponsor? Okay, okay, let me get you off my back. I did that. Um, and then she started being like, hey, we need to work the steps. Okay, I, you know, just to get her off my back. All right, like, yeah, 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 we can read this book, work the steps. And um, and she said, okay, it's time to get into like the, you know, you know, she we had started working steps one through three. And I think the hardest thing for me, I could concede to myself I was an alcoholic and an addict. That wasn't a problem. The unmanageability was the part I really couldn't identify with. Because you remember, you know, ad, uh, you know, addicts and alcoholics, they live under a bridge, they've got no money, you know, their family has shunned them. That wasn't me. So it was very difficult for me to identify with unmanageability until she said, why don't we write out some examples of like where you tried to stop and couldn't or some of the things that you did. And that's when all that shit came roaring back into my, things I had, I just had like blocked out. All those times I stole that medication, times where I went to the doctor, you know, faking injuries, things like that. Like this stuff came back and I was like, Ooh, that sounds, maybe that's a little unmanageable. Her approach was working, once we got to the action steps, we would work steps four through 12 in one day. That was how her sponsor did it. And that was the way she was gonna do it with me. And so I got to her house at eight o'clock and didn't know what to expect. You know, again, I hadn't planned to do this, right? So. Um, I sat and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and we talked and I shared and wrote some more. I mean, it was just like intense work where things were coming, you know, back like memories, things that I hadn't thought of in decades, you know, the defects, you know, looking at those things and realizing I had these long before I ever picked up a first drink and I've still got them now. And there are things that stand in the way of me being able to keep this, this gift, you know, that I've been given. And, um, you know, we went through it and it was intense. And I remember, you know, towards the end of it, um, I was, I think I was driving home and it was like, like that was heavy, but then it was gone. You know, it was like that, that freedom like came almost immediately. Like I could not believe I had bared my soul to this other person like and and you know what she said towards the end is she said okay now that you know we're done with these steps um you know i still had amends to make and things like that and she said but i want you to start raising your hand when they ask who's willing to sponsor at meetings and i was like ah okay i came this far like i'm not I, you know i really don't think i'm ready to do that and she said um you know I, I sat with you, you know, to do this and now I want you to pass it on, you know, I was like, okay, um, all right, I guess, I guess I can do that. And I, I said, I wasn't going to do all these things. And it was like my higher power just, it was like, I was kind of just almost on autopilot. Like I wasn't in control anymore. Um, and maybe that was part of the surrender where at some point, these things, it was like I was just doing them and all of a sudden I was like, oh shit, I just worked the steps. Oh God, I just became somebody's sponsor. Like, it, you know, I didn't mean to do these things. Like, you know, actively, intentionally, I didn't mean to, but it was like my higher power just kept me in it. And, you know, I, I start to look back and I'm like, holy shit, I'm taking somebody through the steps. Like, this is a big responsibility. Like, and not only that, 
every time I was meeting with these sponsees and starting to go through the same process that my sponsor went through with me, it was like, I walked away and I was like, damn, like I feel, I was on a high, you know, and I can't describe it, you know, but the book talks about, you know, being amazingly lifted up after working with another alcoholic. And I didn't think I could ever not be, you know, the selfish kind of self-centered person I was to be able to give someone else my time. Um, I just, I didn't think I would ever get there. And so that was a huge gift, you know, to be able to, to actually do that. Um, identifying what fear was, because I had misconceptions. Everybody in, in early recovery kept talking about all this fear and everybody were all afraid. And I was like, I don't identify with that. I'm afraid of three things, heights, water and most animals, even small ones like birds, you know, and definitely bugs. But like, that was it. And then someone explained to me like the fear, that anxiety that you, that you always felt, you know, the fear of not belonging, the fear of doing something wrong, you know, the fear of being found out, you know, of that mask, you know, being, being taken off. Like those are all fears, you know, and, and those fears, um, you know, when, when we're going through the steps, you know, it talks about, you know, resentments, arise out of fear. You know, that's the number one offender. So I had to go through and I had to make a lot of amends um, to people that I was holding on to resentments um, about. And um, I don't, you know, just discovering these spiritual tools, that there were ways to address things that were completely out of my control. Because before I thought I had power and I thought, you know, I've managed my life well enough and I've done a really good job you know, which is why I ended up in, you know, in treatment. Um, but it was, you know, that surrender and identifying who my specific higher power is. And, you know, um, in going through, you know, going to meetings and beginning to take on service positions and, you know, being of service to other people inside and outside of the rooms, um, you know, it, life still happens. And so, you know, as I, you know, one, one of the beautiful things, gifts of the program um, that I was given was I met my husband in this program. And that is, uh, I mean, I didn't know how to have a genuine relationship before that. I mean, there was, there was no such thing. I mean, all my relationships were toxic. I was somewhat abusive um, to, not physically, you know, but I've got a mouth on me. And so, um, you know, there just was no such thing as like a healthy relationship. And I learned how to love and how to be loved in this program. And that's a miracle. Um, you know, I found a sponsor that I did not have to duck and dodge. Like I used to call my first sponsor and pray she wouldn't pick up the phone. Now she took me through the steps and she did a phenomenal job kind of, you know, showing me what it is to be entirely willing to do whatever it takes, you know, to get this, get this thing. But, um, you know, my second sponsor brought something like a, a friendship and a certain, I guess, level of just, um, genuine kind of uh, camaraderie, just, I can't describe it, but the, the friendship and the love that, um, that we share and how raw and transparent and honest I can be with her, even when I am ashamed and I say to myself, oh God, I'm, you know, I can't believe this is about to come out of my mouth, but, and, you know, and I just spill it, you know, and I tell on everything, you know, everything that my disease is saying to me, I share with her and we talk about it. We work fourth steps on people, on institutions, on things. Um, you know, I had my first child, you know, as a result of this program, had I not met my husband, one person can't make a child apparently. So, you know, I did that and that has been miraculous, you know, and, and being able to have a child who does not have to see either of his parents, um, ever drunk or under the influence is, is a miracle. You know, I joked the first, I think it was maybe the third day he was home from the hospital that I believed that he was restless, irritable, and discontent because he wouldn't go to sleep. But that's just, you know, that's not me, you know, lobbing the, the disease on him. It's just me being like, good Lord, is this what it looks like? You know, when, you know, but anyway, um, you know, I'm, I've dealt with a lot of, powerlessness lately, even as of late, as of the last year, you know, I'm powerless over whether or not my kid is going to sleep through the night. I am powerless over our financial situation right now, which is not exactly where we'd like it to be. Um, you know, I'm powerless over people, places and things, but 
the conception of the higher power that I um, created in this program is one that is going to see me through any challenge, um, a higher power that's going to always provide for our needs no matter what. And I've had to relearn what it means to surrender. Um, you know, I think you, at least for me, I got into the program, got all these things back, had this great life and all these positive things happen. And my brain can start to, you know, assign credit to myself for those things happening so that when something goes wrong, I feel like I got to, you know, let me, let me, you know, put on my cape and I got to go to work and get to action. I got to fix these things. Um, but that's the same approach I used when I was trying to apply the alcoholism and addiction cure, and it didn't work. I need people. I need the fellowship. I need to share. I need to talk to my sponsor. I need to continue to work the steps. Um, I need to get on my knees and I need to give it over to God and truly give it, give it up and surrender. Um, so I'm, I am learning a faith today that I don't, I don't think I had an early sobriety because now that the drinks and, you know, the drink and the, the substances are gone. I'm still left with defects and I'm still left with life on life's terms. And the only way I can remain sane and still have a piece of serenity is to continue to work the program and use the tools that got me here in the first place. Um, you know, I mentioned I didn't intend to get this deep into the program. Um, but now, you know, I'm afraid not to do the things that I've been doing because I don't know which ones work and I don't know why they work, but I'm too afraid to give one up and find out that that was the one, you know, that that was responsible for keeping me sober. Um, I am blessed beyond words. Like I, you know, I wake up and, you know, I, I take the suggestions of my sponsor. So when she says, you need to do some gratitude, you need to journal, I journal. Um, you know, I, I had a woman once tell me when I'm in a lot of fear, which has been recently, do two columns on a sheet of paper. Um, one column, write down your fears. And on the other column, do a gratitude list. And she said, start with your toothbrush and just go from there, everything you're grateful for. So I was writing pages and pages and pages and I had my fears over here. And so when we looked at them, she said, okay, everything on your fear list, things like, um, oh God, well, this might happen or you know, this could happen. Okay, false evidence appearing real. None of these things are real. Look at your gratitude list. Everything there is tangible, real things you can point to, things that you are experiencing that are true. Um, and that's how you think about fear is it doesn't exist. It's your mind. It's that obsession of the mind that is saying, oh, God, worst case scenario. What if this happens? And what if that happens? And what will I do? And those things don't exist unless I let my mind, the obsession of the mind start to take over. Um, so I'm just, I'm still like such a work in progress. And, you know, I go to meetings and I hear from people who have like a week and I hear something where I'm like, God damn, that, like, that was profound. And that's like the thing that keeps me in it. It's just hearing, you know, that one thing or getting to talk to somebody who's new or talk to somebody who's been in the program for a while. It's that being lifted back up on my feet again. Um, but I just have to remember I have to, I got to take that action. I got to get to a meeting in order to get those messages. I have to connect with people. Um, and that's not something I've always been great about is, you know, reaching out proactively and, and trying to form connections. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like what happened when I got the DUI that night, even though I had been praying to God, just heal me, cure me, take this all away. That was divine intervention because I think my higher power knew as long as I still had all these things and, you know, life still looked good on the outside, I was never going to be able to really fully say I need help. I was going to keep trying to do it on my own because there was, there were no consequences and, you know, everything still looked good. Um, and I look back on that night as like, that was my higher power's way. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to give you what you want. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, give you recovery, but you're going to have to do it my way according to my will, not yours. And, uh, and so that's how I kind of choose to look at things now is, you know, my financial situation right now, you know, is not exactly where I want it to be, but my higher power 
I truly believe is taking me somewhere, is taking my family somewhere. There's something I am supposed to learn um, that he can't just let me win that Powerball. You know, that'd be too easy. Like, that's what I would like. But my higher power has got something else in, in, in mind. Um, and uh, as long as I, you know, believe that, you know, I think it was my sponsor who said, um, you know, there's um, a really great, and I don't want to say scripture, but it, you know, essentially says, you know, I am not here to harm you. I, I'm here to prosper you. And I love to lean on that. That's the kind of higher power I have is one that's very loving, that's kind, that's accepting of me and all these defects and is patient with me as I take my will back over and over again and give him back a little bit and take it back again. And he's just, he's there constantly. So, um, gosh, do I have anything else? Um, that I feel is important that I may have glossed over. I don't know. I just, you know, even, you know, with having a kid, um, today it's, you know, I've found meetings that have babysitting. Like there is literally like someone said, yeah, you want to be there to do your son's, you know, I have a spa routine that I do for my son instead of just bath time. It's a spa routine, mm -hmm. um, with aromatherapy and a soundtrack and it's done in a sauna like environment. But anyway, um, when I do that, you know, I was like, I need to be there for that every night. And it was like, yeah, but whatever you put before you right, are you going to lose? So make a choice. <laughs> and, uh, I found meetings with babysitting and other moms who are in recovery who can share with me how they balance out motherhood and recovery. You know, my husband recently approached me and was like, what would you think about like starting a meeting for like couples in recovery? I was like, God, that's a good idea. Cause again, unique, you know, kind of experiences and perspectives, but all using the same spiritual tools to try and, you know, apply them in different areas of life. And so, um, this program is, you know, I've learned so much. It's not about, removing the alcohol and the drugs. Um, it is, it is a way, you know, of, of living, you know, that works in rough going. And it's proven that time and time again, I'm so grateful to be able to have the opportunity to share my story. Um, and, uh, thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.